said, I'm primarily a historian of Ireland um, and primarily a historian of political violence in Ireland. My, the book I'm working on just now is a study of individuals who have been labelled terrorists um, from the 19th to the 21st century. And I was thinking back over the chapters that I've written um, in these books and realised that in most of the cases of the people that I've been looking at, their political violence is carried out in cities. It's an urban phenomenon. And I think that reflects the fact that modern terrorism is largely, not exclusively, but largely an urban event. It takes place in places like some of the places I've looked at, New York, um, Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, Seattle, Frankfurt, Dublin, and Belfast. Um, so my original work has been on Ireland, um, and Irish history sort of burst back into the news last week with the arrest of Gerry Adams for his alleged part in a particularly um, heinous murder which occurred in 1972, and that's the murder of Jean McConville. And I've been following all the news stories about the McConville case, and there's a very kind of active blogosphere uh, which presents conflicting theories of various sorts, and you could easily disappear down that rabbit hole and never come out again. But I thought it might be interesting to look at the McConville case and think about what that actually tells us about how violence functioned um, in Belfast in that period, of, early period of the Troubles. So for those who don't know uh, who Jean McConville was, she was a 36-year-old uh, Protestant woman from Belfast. She, had, she was widowed um, and she was the mother of nine children. Um, she was born in the industrial heartland of Belfast, in the shadow of those two great big um, cranes, the Harland and Wolf Cape cranes. Um, so within a stone's throw of the shipyard, which really made Belfast as a city in the 19th century. Um, those industries were declining by the time of her birth, just before the Second World War. Um, and she went into domestic service. So clearly there's, there's still a servant economy um, which, has con which was still in place in Belfast um, in the 1960s. Um, she went into domestic service in a Catholic household and uh, fell in love with the, the, the son of that household, um, a Catholic Belfast man named Arthur, who was, in a slightly complicated issue, was a servant in the British Army. So identity was not so um, exclusivist in, in those days that Northern Catholics would not serve in the British Army. Um, so they settle in East Belfast, a mixed family, have lots of children, um, and when violence breaks out in the summer of 1969, there's intense communal rioting. Um, her, her family, herself, her husband and her children, are driven out of, um, of their home in East Belfast. And they move, I looked at it on Google Maps, they moved three and a half miles across the river to the other side of the city to a Catholic area. Um, the place where she moved to was a very large tower block called Divis Towers. Um, which is now mostly gone. There's one, one tower block still left. There was a whole complex of them. And that reflects the expansion of Belfast, uh, or the change in Belfast housing in the post-war period as the Edwardian slums are gradually pulled down for the most part. Um, it's also a function of the fact that large areas of Belfast were destroyed during the Blitz um, in, in the Second World War. And so the post-war housing expansion um, like in many British cities, takes the form of these high-rise flats. So between 1969 and her death in 1972, where um, Jean McConville lived was, that area of West Belfast, was disfigured by extreme and sustained violence. Um, the burning of Bombay Street, the Falls Road curfew, the Ballymurphy massacre, frequent riots in the wake of these events and in the wake of other events in Derry. And it is in that context of intense street conflict, um, gun battles, sniper attacks, frequent army patrols, that she was taken from her home in December 1972, um, t driven south uh, across the border to the beach where she was executed by the provisional IRA. And her 
I think her life story and her movements within, Bel within Belfast and that last sad journey to where she met her death tell us a lot about Northern Irish society as it developed in those early heated years <laughs> of the Troubles. And Be there's no question that Belfast between 1969 and 72 was an incredibly dangerous place. You have tightly packed houses, you have cul-de-sacs, you have high-rise flats, you have large um, outbreaks of street violence, you have um, British Army units who don't really know the geography of the city. Um, and it's a, I think it is, for the historian, it presents a particular set of challenges to convey that, that physicality, that claustrophobia of, of a contested violent space in the written word. Um, one of the interesting things which the McConville case brings up uh, is how identity is signalled in the urban environment in times of conflict. Um, there was a lot of anxiety in Belfast that summer as to how, how did you know who your neighbours were? How did you know who was a threat living amongst your community? Um, and that's what explains these expulsions. Um, it's, it's, it's not clear by looking at somebody or even talking to somebody whether they are Catholic or Protestant. Um, there is no skin colour, there is no accent that would differentiate, there is no language difference. So residence becomes um, one of the key signifiers of communal identity. And there's a move on both sides to create, um, I suppose, monolithic uh, residential spaces where people feel safer. Um, so the city and the home can, is only safe if you're surrounded, if it's familiar and if you're surrounded by your um, people from your own community. Um, so the first challenge in telling stories about Belfast or other um, violent Irish cities is that it requires a particular understanding of how urban geography functions. So this, I think, picks up on Charlie's and James's point that you need to walk the city, you need to know what streets look like, what, who lives where, how, that, how residents in those streets have changed over time. Um, a mixed estate, for instance, in Belfast in 1965 might have changed political complexion entirely by 1975, might have changed political complexion entirely again by, 19, by 2005. Um, and there is a sense in which there are some uh, communities which are becoming more uh, inclusive and more more mixed in the post-peace process era. Um, I lived in Belfast, I did my PhD at, at Queen's, um, lived in Belfast for quite a few years and one of the last place I lived in Belfast was in a street off one of the main arterial routes called the, the Ormo Road. And we lived about a mile and a half from the city centre, just off the Ormo Road. So we frequently walked in and out along that main street. Um, and in that short journey, a mile and a half, this was in the the two kind of the mid mid years of the two thousands, um, walking into town, you went through about or you passed through or walked past about half a dozen different political neighbourhoods. So you started off where where we lived, which was kind of a burgeoning hipster space where people who did who kind of post grads and bohemian types uh, lived in in the first place. Then you passed right beside where we lived was a, a working class loyalist district with an orange hall and an orange band and during the summer you'd hear marches and how space, how people take ownership of space through demonstrations, through marches, through monuments and memorials is another interesting aspect of urban history I think. So you go past the loyalist district, then you get to student land, uh, the Holy Lands is an area of Belfast which you go past and that's where all the students in Queens live which is um, the site of much partying and much um, grotesque uh, carnivals at certain times of the year. And then you go through about four different versions of republicanism, none of whom particularly are well disposed towards each other. And just in that you know, 1.5 mile strip into town, you can see different communities who are living literally cheek by jowl with each other. So I think a knowledge, a nuanced understanding of the, act, of the urban geography of the city is essential in trying to write about how violence works in these cities. But the other challenge um, which I've encountered is to try and look beyond the violent city that I, cities that I've just described and to try and see the other side of the city in conflict. And that is to try and understand how ordinary people continued with their lives um, even during periods of intense violence. Um, 
in Dublin during the revolutionary period, um, there were military curfews, um, there were widespread patrols from various uh, crown forces, but social life continued. Um, if you look at any of the newspapers which were printed in Dublin um, during the period of 1919 to 21, you can see that the cinemas are still running, the theatres are still running, um, there are seaside excursions, the races are still going, um, political and literary salons are still, ca are still continuing. Um, so I think it's important that we recognise that. Belfast is the same. There is a, a valiantly vibrant cultural scene during, throughout the Troubles, particularly in literary culture. You have the very strong Belfast poet scene, poetry scene. Popular music um, is still a facet of Belfast life during the 1970s and 1980s. The show band, uh, show bands continue in Belfast much later than they do in the rest of Ireland for some reason. Um, and Belfast has its own little punk scene in the 1970s as well. And so I think it is a responsibility of the historian of the violent city to also acknowledge that there are still fun times to be had in cities during times of conflict. Um, and I think we have to try and turn the traditional histories of conflicted cities on their heads and try and also include the stories of those ordinary people who had ordinary lives in extraordinary cities at extraordinary times. <coughs> and I think I will finish up there. Thank you.